Welcome to Convergent Dialogues. This is Xavier Bonilla. On this episode, I'm speaking with Matthew Cobb. Matthew is the professor in the School of Biological Sciences at the University of Manchester. He is his PhD from the University of Sheffield, and he is well published in the literature. He is the author of seven books, uh, namely The Idea of the Brain, and his most recent book, as God's A Moral History of the Genetic Age, and that's what we talk about in this conversation. We talk about his reasons for writing the book and why one should be worried about genetic engineering. We talk about how one defines genetic engineering, some of the precursor tools before recombinant DNA. We talk about recombinant DNA, Paul Berg, Asilomar. We talk about the genetic history of GMOs, we talk about gene editing and CRISPR, and we talk about the future of genetic engineering. Uh, Matthew is a fantastic researcher, um, teacher, and just an excellent uh, writer. Um, I quite enjoyed the idea of the brain, and so I was super excited to read his new book, and it did not disappoint. It's a very, very comprehensive um, history of genetic engineering, which really has its origins in, I guess you could say, the 40s or 50s of the 20th century, and really has just kind of exploded uh, in modern times. Many people have been thinking about, uh, you know, gene editing, um, obviously CRISPR technology, some of the ethics around these things. And so his book is a, is a wonderful history uh, of this and tries to deal with some of the you know, big concerns about how do we have an ethical stance about how we use uh, genetic engineering. There's many good tools, there's many good things that could come of it, but there's some very big dangers as well. And so he um, writes very well in the book, and it's, we talk about in the conversation about some of those worries, and then obviously the, the wonderful potentials as well. Um, all in all, I had a fantastic time with the conversation. He's uh, very brilliant, very kind, and his book is fantastic. And so now I bring him, Matthew Cobb. I'm here with Matthew Cobb. Matthew, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I'm uh, greatly looking forward to uh, talking to you. Thanks a lot for the invitation, Xavier. It's great to be here. Of course. Uh, you have written a fantastic book. Uh, it's called As Gods, Moral History of the Genetic Age. Um, you've also written a, a previously wonderful book, which I greatly enjoyed, The Idea of the Brain. That's a fantastic book. It's a really, really great book as well. So you are just churning out the hits over here. This is very, very good stuff. <laughs> well, that's good to hear. We'll see. We'll see with this one. <laughs> so before we get into it, just tell listeners uh, just uh, who you are, what your background's in, what you study, uh, what, you're, what you're currently researching. Uh, my name is Professor Matthew Cobb. I'm at the University of Manchester in the School of Biological Sciences. Uh, and I study kind of evolutionary neurobiology, uh, but also genetics and also the history of science. So I do a mixture of stuff which informs my writing. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's wonderful. Your, your writing is, is very good. And it it's definitely has a nice kind of integrative uh, approach, which is very, very nice. Um, so for this new book, um, I was really excited about it and it didn't disappoint. You give basically in the beginning, you talk about three recent developments, which you talk about later in the book. You talk about CRISPR, well, obviously, which we'll get to gene drives, variants of lethal pathogens. And my impression from the book overall was that you were you were very worried about these things, less about the, oh, look at all these advancements in science, look at all these great things. I mean, there's that bit of it as well. But the 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 kind of tenor I got as you go through the history was that you're worried. You're you're a little a little bit worried about these things. Could you maybe just tell us about why these things worry you so much? Well, yeah, I am worried. That's why I, I wrote the book. I mean, what I was aware of and still am, however, is that my worries are essentially this or they're very similar to those that scientists have had since the beginning of genetic engineering in fact even before it began mm. um it began kind of officially 50 years ago and even before that people were concerned about what might happen so these aren't new worries but there are new possibilities mm. uh, that are facing us and i wanted to explore whether my concerns were really any different from those in the past when people had 
been worried about things and there've been, you know, protests and debates and all the rest of it, but in the end things have turned out okay. Mm. Or whether this time round it really is scary and we we really should be worried. So that was kind of the the motivation for for writing the book. And the fundamental reason why all people have always been concerned is that um as Sidney Brenner, the great molecular geneticist who played a key role in <clears throat> kind of turning this from a uh, a set of research proposals into an actual field that was publicly acceptable, as he put it in a when he gave evidence to the, the, the British Parliament, I think it was in the mid 1970s. This is a technology, and all technologies are, are dangerous. But mm. the difference between, say, a, a car accident and uh, something going wrong in a genetics laboratory is that, in general, road traffic accidents aren't self-replicating. Mm. So mm. if something goes wrong <clears throat> in a genetics lab, we make a mistake or we're doing something that is dangerous and it escapes, mm. then that can have serious consequences. It's not just like, okay, well, somebody's going to be knocked over and killed, which is terrible, but you know, we don't stop driving cars or whatever. Mm -hmm. So um, that that's the big difference. And each of those three areas that I outline at the beginning of the book um, are things that are I think qualitatively new in terms of our ability to it's not it's not so much CRISPR. CRISPR is fantastic tool for scientific discovery. It's more what has been done with it with the kind of acceptance of much of the scientific community at the time in terms of changing genes for the future, not genes in our, say, our red blood cells, but changing uh, cells in every changing genes in every cell in the body. Mm. and therefore passing them down to the next generation. So I think that's that's worrying, that's ethically worrying, and uh, yeah, I'm, I am concerned about that. The, the other two dangers that I'm worried about are gene drives, which are, again, very well-meaning in, in, in really, they are attempts to manipulate natural populations, in particular of disease vectors like uh, mosquitoes, but using a, a kind of a gene that will copy itself uh, very, very rapidly, and will mean that if we were to release one of these gene drives, it would, in a matter of a few dozen generations, sweep through the whole population. So we could mm. alter ecosystems. And that yeah. seems to me to be very concerning. The final element, <clears throat> which has got a lot of press recently, um, and I am going to preface my comments with a clear statement that there is no evidence that COVID-19 was engineered, <laughs> quite the opposite, all the evidence points yeah. uh, to it being a natural spillover from uh, bats or almost certainly bats mm -hmm. in China. Mm -hmm. But we have been, for the last 20 years, we have been what is called gain of function research, mm -hmm. which is a way of trying to predict the future course of development of pandemics by making dangerous viruses even more dangerous trying to see what what their genes could hold right. so again it's very well meaning but slightly alarming mm, and there yes. is a lot more debate about there's a lot of debate about that area in particular uh between uh some virologists uh, defend it tooth and nail others are very critical and i'm more on the critical side so those are the three areas that i'm concerned about Mm -hmm. But my fears are also echoed in the past by worries about the combinant DNA from 50 years ago, which turned out to be not problematic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but we, we might get a little bit to the gain of function research again. That's obviously been in the news. And I, I recently talked to David mm -hmm. Quaman, who just wrote a very good book on on uh, the pandemic. And we talked about that. And, and it's, it's, it's again, he has the same belief i think a lot of people have this belief that it's probably a zoonotic leap uh, in terms of some type of spillover uh but you know people are going to keep going on with the with the ideas yeah. about what you know some other kind of more spurious activity um so let's just let's just start i guess with describing we'll, we'll kind of go th walk through some of the history but you know how do you typically or how do you when we when we look at like a classification system of sorts how do we understand genetic engineering as producing inherited changes right so what's the the reach of genetic engineering for our society and we'll talk about the origins but just more generally how do we define what is and what isn't kind of genetic engineering for for us well the starting point is the word which is the terms i mean you know i i've been very old school in terms of talk about genetic engineering um uh, the the, the process has, has had a whole series of different names, mm -hmm. partly as a, 
as scientists have attempted to uh, evade the downside or the, the the you know any any concerns that are accumulating around the current method and they say well we've got a new method of doing this and this is going to be completely different and it's it's the most obvious example is gene editing mm -hmm. which we now talk about and gene editing sound kind of domestic and benign and not worrying at all mm -hmm. um whereas in fact it's exactly this i mean it's a bit more precise or should be um but it's basically the same technique as we've been using for 50 years my definition of what genetic engineering is to distinguish it from the alteration of other species which we have been making happen since we appeared on the planet because we're predators, we're herbivores, we will eat animals, and that changes the things we're eating. The thing, you know, by catching the slower animals, we're making the prey go faster or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, the, the difference with genetic engineering is that it is involves mixing DNA from different types of organism in a way mm -hmm. that was not possible before the development of these techniques in the early 1970s. People could think about it, they could dream about it, but that it, that is the key thing that can change DNA more or less precisely. Previously, we've been able to uh, mutate. For example, you know, most of the plants we eat come from a process of mutation. You right. mutate them with you know, x-rays or whatever, uh, and then you get lots of variants, and then you choose the one that does what you're interested in, has mm -hmm. high yields or can resist uh, de desiccation or whatever. So uh, the difference is that genetic engineering in principle enables you to short circuit this very, very long, tortuous process and to change an organism in exactly the way you wanted it to. Mm. And probably the most graphic in, and significant example of that was what helped launch this discovery into the commercial world and into changing our age. That's why the subtitle of the book is The Genetic Age, mm -hmm. um, which is, in fact, its full title in the UK. We've got different titles on the yeah, yeah. Uh, two sides. <laughs> right, and, right. and different covers as well. Right, so, right, right. <laughs> um, was the ability to get genes that would encode a protein that was of particular significance to us, such as insulin or the precursor mm -hmm. of insulin in fact to put that gene into a bacterium which has never in three billion years done anything like make that protein because they don't use insulin or pro-insulin as it's called in fact this is this precursor mm -hmm. but you they were able to put that gene into a bacterium and then get it to start producing this protein which they could then very simply turn to insulin and that kind of magic that that transformation of a bacteria into a little factory mm. is really what's happening mm. uh is was absolutely radical in terms of changing people's impression of what was possible mm. but also making many people uh think okay and you know dollar signs flashed up in their mm. eyes and some people got incredibly rich okay. and above all we have now insulin that is better than what was available before genetic engineering because before we could put this gene into a, a microbe we had to use animal insulin so basically you get a lot of pancreases from a slaughterhouse you mush them up you extract the insulin but it's not exactly the same as human insulin so in the old days in the 60s and before people who took insulin eventually kind of ended up with an allergic response to it so the, what we now have is as good as it could be um and it should be an awful lot cheaper and indeed it is in the uk mm -hmm. and in europe but mysteriously in the us it isn't. no 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 it is <laughs> so that's it a is different not. issue <laughs> it is not it is not at all it's high expensive it's 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 really uh it's really uh, devastating the so it's, it's interesting okay so having that kind of that outlook on understanding kind of what it is and, and how it works you you kind of give this kind of sort of like a prelude of sorts that, you know, a lot of this, any types of uh, genetic engineering types of things, you know, before really the sixties was like works of science fiction, right? Which we don't have to get into. It was really interesting. I, I didn't really recognize that. And then you, you talk about in the, in the sixties, there was these kind of tools that started to come online, which is, you know, synthesizing DNA, you know, RNA viruses, infecting copies of cells of RNA to, to DNA restriction enzymes. So I guess we'll, we'll get to the seventies here with, with Pete Paul Berg and, and, uh, Asselmar. But I guess the, the question I have here is, is how did these kind of tools and these pieces kind of come into place for then this kind of, you know, explosion of genetic engineering? Mm 
Well, as soon as people realize that, uh, as, as one of the early genetic engineers put it, when they got insulin to work, they said, well, Watson and Crick were right. I, that there, you know, DNA encodes proteins that you could actually understand the, the, what, a, what a gene was doing in terms of making proteins. People started to imagine a scientist, not just science fiction writers, scientists started to think, well, how could we actually change the change a gene we could alter it or introduce a new desired piece of dna and as you as you've indicated there are a whole series of <clears throat> molecular tools effectively that were developed partly just to understand how cells work but also for some for the most far-seeing researchers with the idea that eventually at some unknown point in the future these tools will be useful for assembling cutting bits of dna i mean initially it was simply trying to understand how cells work and in particular mm -hmm. how cells react to viruses mm -hmm. so one of the uh, key enzymes that were discovered were what are called restriction enzymes and these are enzymes that will restrict the growth of viruses in certain bacteria because if the enzyme is present the bacterium can chop up the dna of the invading uh, microbe the invading virus mm -hmm. so people this people were interested in in viruses and, and microbes going way back to the the early uh, the 1950s because these were the simplest well, we can argue about whether viruses are alive, but that's the simplest forms of life. They, mm -hmm. There are ways of trying to, this is how we understood how molecular genetics works, was using these microbes, bacteria and viruses, not by studying mice or insects or anything like that. You're, you're studying single-celled organisms or things that aren't actually organisms at all, but are simply pieces of replicating nucleic acid, viruses. So, in trying to understand that, which was a huge field, they started to discover these enzymes that would, for example, uh, chop up DNA at very, very specific points that could recognize a sequence and would home in on it and then chop up viral DNA. So these were restriction enzymes. They also discovered other enzymes that would enable bits of DNA to fuse, so effectively a kind of chemical glue, mm -hmm. um, and also uh, other uh enzymes and ways of, back, of that viral replication, which mean that you could copy RNA into DNA. And the, all these various tools were primarily studied for their in their own right as part of this understanding of, of how viruses replicate, which clearly eventually has some kind of uh, applied consequence, but at the time it was just fundamental science. Mm. And then a bit like getting, um, uh, you know, a, a Lego kit or mm -hmm. uh, an erector set. People mm -hmm. are beginning to realise that they can put these bits mm -hmm. together, like, like an and assembly. do various interesting yeah. things with it. Yeah. yeah. So that eventually it became obvious to most people by the end of the 1960s, before it had even been done, that this would be possible. That this was going to come. We mm -hmm. would be able to do this in the next few years because all of the bits are beginning to kind of come into focus. Yeah, that's that's it's interesting how these things kind of sort themselves out. Where once you, you know, you uh, once you open Pandora's box, right? You start playing with pieces here. Then you start to see, oh, there's other potential for things here. And but you know, it sounds like it started kind of very innocently. It was just trying to understand how things kind of work. And then it's like, okay, now we can now. Well, what if we did this? And what if we did this? And then you know, if you have the pieces there and you understand how it works, you know, then you can start you know really uh, playing around with different things. So take us to 72. So you do, you know, Paul Berg, um, he, he added the, uh, the SV40 to the DNA from the E. coli and the, the, the big re recombinant DNA. Uh, this was like the, yeah. the big, big thing that you mentioned throughout the book. So just tell us about him, recombinant DNA and why it was so important. Yeah. So Paul Berg was a, uh, still is, he's still alive and as bright as a button <laughs> you did last year and he was amazing. He's 95, 96 now. Um, wow, at wow. the time he was in his mid forties, uh, he was at Stanford and he was interested. He, he kind of moved fields and decided in the end of the 1960s, he wanted to understand gene function in mammalian cells. So as I said, most of what we knew about how genes work was all done on bacteria, which are apparently much simpler than our our cells. I mean, for a start, there's only one cell. They're not multicellular organisms, but even the organization of the cell is much simpler. Mm. And 
what Berg wanted to understand is, well, what happens in a mammalian cell? And you could grow lines of cells in petri dishes, uh, you know, from hamsters or even ultimately from humans and study them and see how, how they work. And what he wanted to do was to get a gene with a known function. One of these genes from E. coli, which is the main bacterium that everybody had been studying right. and to put it into a a human cell or a mammalian cell, and then see what happened. And to do that, he wanted to use SV40, which is this virus which will infect human cells and put its DNA uh, into that. So what he was planning to do was to get some uh, E. coli, e. coli b- bacterium, which he knew exactly what it did, was well studied, and then put it into e- into SV40 using these molecular scissors and glue that had been <clears throat> discovered or invented, if you prefer, over the last uh, few years, and then put that into a, a cell line. Now, that was what he did in 1972, and that's what led to the explosion of um, the explosion of what was called at the time recombinant DNA, because he was mixing up DNA. In the end, he had DNA from a virus, from a, a bacterium, and from a mammal, all in the same cells. So it was a weird kind of thing. Mm-hmm. The problem arose, in fact, the year before. So he this this was his main project. He had a PhD student called Janet Mertz, and her task was to do kind of the opposite experiment. Her task was to get some DNA from SV40, this virus, and to put it into E. coli. Mm. Now, there was no real reason to do that. It was just a side project for a PhD student. It wasn't what Berg wanted to do. And when Mertz went to Cold Spring Harbor in California, uh, when Mertz went to Cold Spring Harbor out on Long Island for a training course, she explained to her tutor, uh, Bob Pollack, who was in his early 30s, well, I'm going to be putting this SV40 into E. coli. And Bob went nuts. He said, this is crazy. Why are you doing this experiment? Because SV40 is thought to cause cancer in cell lines of hamsters, at least, and maybe in us. And you want to put this gene from SV40 into something that lives in all our guts? Are you crazy? Mm-hmm. So he then picked up the phone the next day and phoned Berg and said, why are you doing this crazy experiment? Mm-hmm. Berg told him to get lost. He'd never heard of this guy and was kind of, <laughs> you know, Berg was a big shot and this this guy mm-hmm. was nobody. So he was very rude to him, apparently. Mm-hmm. Um, but Berg then went away and thought hard about it and talked to people. And he decided that, well, OK, it's not very likely anything's going to go wrong, but I don't really care about that experiment. It's the other one that really interests me. I want to get the, the E. coli uh, DNA into a human cell line or a mammalian cell line. So that's what I'm going to do. So he he agreed not to do the experiment because it was potentially too dangerous before anybody even knew about it, before the experiment had been done. So the first of four uh, moments in which geneticists have paused their research took place kind of in private. Mm. So the next year, 72, he publishes his article, Janet Mertz, uh, as part of a PhD, then makes it the technique even more developed. And then within a few months, uh, Stan Cohen and her boyer uh, at Stanford and at uh, the University of California, San Francisco, make the method even more simple using uh, a particular piece of bacterial DNA called a plasmid. And basically, th- this this is what was, we now call cloning. It's mm. the possibility of making lots of copies of DNA and basically introducing DNA from any species into any other species. And mm. Berg said when he heard about their paper, this makes it possible to do anything. Mm. And that was the second moment when people heard about this, in particular, a group of young researchers at a conference, they got rather alarmed. They said, well, wait a minute, should we be doing this? Is this safe? Mm -hmm. What's going to happen? We're mixing up DNA. We've no idea what could happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Berg was again kind of pulled into these ethical issues, which he initially had not been interested in. And he ended up, because he was a member of the National Academy of Sciences, he ended up uh, charged by the NAS to uh, get together a group of leading scientists to write a an open letter to come to a position on this new technology, which he developed. And the decision they came to in 1974 was to have what they called, what became known as a moratorium, a research pause. Mm. And the word moratorium is quite significant because in fact, it had been coined or used, entered public usage in 
during the period of uh, atmospheric testing of nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. And so it was a word, it was a very serious word. It yeah. meant that, you know, there was something really dangerous and we yeah, weren't yeah. going to do it. Mm -hmm. So there's this moratorium, which is declared. It goes on for eight months. And then they have a big meeting in 1975 in February at a cinema, which is very famous uh, mm -hmm. because this was the meeting at which they worked out in a kind of a mixture of a, a, uh, a very high powered uh, academic conference and the worst student politics meeting you can possibly imagine, full of shouting <laughs> and yelling and people being rude to each other. They worked out the safety criteria which would allow these experiments to go ahead. Mm -hmm. So, this meeting is quite famous as an example of self regulation because right. it was just the scientists, it was 200 scientists deciding this. Mm -hmm. But it's very striking. They did not discuss any ethical issues. They didn't, to take the words from uh, Jurassic Park, mm -hmm. they didn't discuss whether they should do these experiments. Right. Mm -hmm. They just looked at whether they could, how they could do it safely. So they ruled out the possibility, discussing the possibility of making weapons out of these, out of using genetic engineering. They ruled out discussing human genetic manipulation, and they ruled out discussing effects on the environment. Uh, which are, in fact, the three things that I'm now really worried about. <laughs> right. <laughs> years, six, you know, nearly 50 years on, the, the chickens have come home to roost. The genetically right. engineered chickens right. <laughs> are now, now home to roost. And we're really faced with those problems, which they decided not to discuss 50 years ago. Yeah, it's, it's strange. I remember you saying this in the book, that there's the pause. They have this advisory committee. comes this big international issue. but then it nothing happened. Nothing really changed yeah, necessarily. I mean, it was like, it, it almost feels like a little bit of fanfare almost of like, but it, I mean, I guess, it, I mean, look, I mean, if, if you take a charitable view of this, right, I, I'll, I'll try to be as charitable as I can. If this is happening and scientists are recognizing this and, you know, 20, 20, 30 years before this, we just realized not even that long that we could do all of these things. It, was it maybe just the kind of novelty of it, of like, wow, like w w this is this is a lot at one time. This is super incredible, and they just never got to the ethics part of it. Or was do you think some kind of in maybe quasi intentional thing of people like, look, let's just not even open up that box because that's just going to be a whole other thing. Well, I mean, guess why do you feel like they didn't consider some of the potential ethical implications? Well, they, I think partly it was a kind of sort of an honesty on their side, on their part, that they they thought, well, we don't know anything about this stuff. Yeah. I mean, they did have some lawyers there, and the lawyers were very significant in saying, you know what, there's health and safety regulation, and the labs have to be safe, mm -hmm. and you can be prosecuted if somebody were to die from one of these infections. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have a disease that you've created inadvertently, and a lab worker dies, then you are facing a multi-million mm -hmm. dollar uh, lawsuit. And apparently yeah. that had a very chilling effect on people <laughs> thinking, okay, maybe we do need to come up with more better biosafety protocols. But in terms of whether these were the right experiments to do, with the exception of manipulating very dangerous pathogens, which everybody agreed they shouldn't be doing, they felt that they didn't have the the knowledge, the expertise, mm. yeah. because they were scientists. Now, to be honest, they didn't know much about biosecurity either. You know, these they, they were molecular biologists and they, you know, did all sorts of terrible things in those days that would not be allowed in labs now. And they thought mm -hmm. were fine. Um, so that I think there was, there was also for some of them, although this wasn't publicly known at the time, there was the whiff of money in the air because yeah. the uh the the Cohen Boyer method of cloning had been patented. A patent mm. had been taken out, but nobody, only a handful of people knew. Berg, who was one of the organizers, found out about two weeks before the conference began mm. that they had carried, made this, taken out this patent. And he was furious because he mm. thought, well, whatever we do, if this gets out, people will think that we're just out to make money. I mean, Berg yeah. never made a penny from any of his research. It wasn't his, uh, wasn't his thing. Mm. Um, so, but I, I, I think it was a lack of, I mean, scientists in general, when they try and talk about philosophy or history are generally pretty rubbish because they're not trained to think that way. <laughs> so uh, I think it was kind of just <laughs> ignorance on their part. They would have had to get some philosophers, yeah. some social scientists, some ethicists involved right. Right. at the beginning. 
And they didn't do that. They chose not to. I think they didn't want too much argument. <laughs> right, right. I mean, it definitely makes it more complicated, but maybe that's one thing to pull from. And I'm sure people do this now, at least I hope so, is that having a kind of multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary kind of approach of like when you're looking at certain things, you should have philosophers of science and ethicists and, yeah. you know, sociologists, psychologists, you know, all of these different uh, fields where everyone's talking to each other. So that way it's not, you have a little bit of this now with kind of like a uh, artificial intelligence, right? You know, with self-driving cars and we have well, all these different we, things. We, 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 we do and we don't. I mean, we've just seen yes, yes, uh, you yeah, know, do we don't. last week Galactica from Meta <laughs> right, right. produced this thing that could produce mm -hmm. nonsensical but nice sounding scientific articles mm -hmm, mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. they didn't have any people, any social scientists or philosophers right. saying, hey, this isn't going to work, folks. <laughs> yeah. And and like that's that's the the always to me, the lesson is who's if you have just engineers or scientists. Like they can, they can, they can write the code, they can do the science, but you need other people to say, okay, but what are the implications of this? Or what, what could happen here? What's the effect on geopolitical kinds of things? What could happen on the human body? Like all of these questions. Um, we can't leave that up to folks that just aren't really thinking about that. Like they're just yeah, doing I, the work, which is absolutely. great. But um yeah so so let's uh we, we can move from 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 the the conference and we'll just we'll just move ahead here because i want to get your ideas from that you put in the book on uh some of these topics which the next kind of I, what i saw was like a bigger section was you talk about gmos now there's much ado about gmos and many people have said a lot of things about it so you don't have to you know put your put your uh flag on one side here necessarily but uh um you you just kind of tell us briefly, just like this origins of studying GM crops and why that was done. Um, and, and and then how did that kind of the gene, uh, direct gene transfer to plants happen? And then we can move to the kind of, I guess, uh, more again of the ethics of it. Yeah. So, well, I was fascinated to discover this. So I, I, I didn't know anything about GM crops. I had like everybody a vague knowledge on them. I didn't know anything about the history of how it had been mm. developed. And the main reason was that a company which now no longer exists, but which has a big role to play and gets a, got a lot of bad press, much of it justified, Monsanto. Yes, yes. They were they were a chemical company in the sixties, and they made uh, DDT, they made AstroTurf, they made Agent Orange, the defoliant from uh, Vietnam. Yeah. So you yeah. know they're kind of like the embodiment of the of the <laughs> awfulness, the anti ecology <laughs> of right. uh, that period. <laughs> right, and. The, the CEO in the late 60s, he, he was quite remarkable. He said, look, this is these literally his terms. This is not sustainable. We cannot carry on producing chemicals that are going to be chucked all over the planet. We shouldn't be doing it. The public won't want us to do it. You know, there's a things are changing. This is yeah. not sustainable, is it? Yeah. So he said, we've got to get out of chemicals. So they then started funding research, which would enable them to do something very clever and which has led to a massive reduction in the amount of insecticide sprayed around the place, which is to introduce a naturally uh, occurring insecticide, which is produced by bacteria for some other reason. They, you know, they don't get eaten by, by insects, but these bacteria produce this insecticide, which will kill caterpillars. So mm -hmm. the idea was if you could manipulate a plant, you could put this gene into the plant. The plant would then produce its own insecticide, mm -hmm. which would stop it being eaten by caterpillars. So mm -hmm. fantastic for, say, um, for, 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 for cotton or corn, for all sorts of products that are you know, otherwise attacked by caterpillars and mean we put a lot of insecticide everywhere. So that was the intention, which I thought was fantastic because who could argue with that? I mean, it right. sounds it, it's really clever. Now, mm -hmm. Actually doing that was very complicated um, and took a lot of time in the late 1970s, early 1980s, a series of labs in Belgium, in the US and Monsanto's own labs. But Monsanto was funding everything because they were, you know, they were putting money into lots of different groups. And by 1983, they were all able to use a, um, a naturally occurring plant virus to be able to introduce new DNA into a plant. But from go from there to getting something in the field, that was another 10 years or more. It was really, really complicated. Mm. Um, and the problem that there's been with 
GM crops in the public mind has been partly because the way that you introduce the CNA is not quite at random, but controlled. So you, you've got a piece of DNA you're interested in, say, this gene which will produce uh, a natural insecticide, which doesn't harm humans. You could eat it as much as you want and won't hurt any other insects unless they eat the plant. Um, you introduce that into the DNA of the plant, but you don't control where it is going to go. Yeah. So and it's a downstream thing. It's, yeah, it's going to jump in anywhere. Right, And right. it may jump into somewhere that it then produces a mutation. Mm -hmm. uh, so it may be that there's something else happening in the plant. And that's one reason why it takes so long for these kind of experiments. You've got to eliminate all the things where it's not mm. right. Yeah. Secondly, you need to know that the experiments work. So you need marker genes, say, uh, antibiotic genes that you put in there. So sometimes this stuff is still in the genome of your GM plant. So people then get the impression that it's not just, okay, it's doing this fancy thing that seems quite sensible, but there's this other stuff in there. I mean, I don't want to eat antibiotic genes. I could end up being, you know, right. Having, right. Get, getting anti resistant to antibiotics. Why do I want that? You know, and that doesn't happen, but this is the kind of concern sure. and the lack of clarity in the method, because it was this kind of semi uncontrolled method uh meant that there was a lot of concerns and it it all kind of congealed in the mid 90s with uh great food scares food security scares mm. the world trade organization uh was set up with an idea we're going to get rid of all um frontiers there'll be no tariffs we'll just have this world of globalized trade and everybody got pretty cross about that there were demonstrations you know yeah. the idea that they whoever they are mm -hmm. you can choose your own bogeyman but they are going to they're going to try to impose their their food on us, Monsanto, the USA, whoever you want. Um, mm -hmm. And they're all over the world, not you know, in the US, in Europe, in UK, in Japan. There are lots and lots of protests about this. Um, yeah. And much of it was actually not to do with the GM crops, which are perfectly safe to eat. But mm -hmm. they do have, uh, they're not a magic bullet because eventually, uh, as uh, famous molecular biologists put it, evolution is smarter than you are. Uh, we've ended up with, uh, for example, to take the natural insecticide, we now have strains of insect that are resistant to this natural insecticide. Mm. And it's the same with the various other forms of GM crops that have been uh, developed. And then Monsanto started to lose the plot a bit and start to prosecute small farmers who are keeping grain from one season to another. You weren't allowed to do that. You had to buy the grain every year. Uh, and this led to a, a great perception that, that Monsanto were doing, you know, were, were the big evil. Yeah. Um, and yeah, they deserve some of that. I think, I think they, well, they recognized their CEO went to a, uh, a green boy well, spoke at a Greenpeace conference in a by video link and said, you know, we we forgot to listen. Well, yeah, mm. Um, mm. but that shows you that, that how things changed around the the turn of the millennium. Mm. But the consequence has been that in general there is still this, uh, although the technology has been taken up in by farmers all over the world, it's transformed a lot of agriculture. It hasn't, you know. No, the public haven't fallen in love with it. <laughs> you know, yeah. We don't like most people don't like it, or they don't know they're eating it. For example, in the US, you mm -hmm. don't know you're eating. But if, there's a QR code on the packaging if you really want to find out uh, is there GM. But if you're eating e eating tacos in the US, then they are their GM because virtually all uh, mm -hmm. corn in the US is is is, is GM. Mm -hmm. In UK, you and in Europe, you don't eat it directly because mm -hmm. you're not allowed to. Mm. But uh, it's imported to feed to animals. So if you eat animals, they've eaten this stuff. But very strikingly, uh, the U.S. Department of Agriculture figures show that productivity has not changed. So we're getting as much out of our land as we mm. ever were. No more. Now, what has changed is the amount of insecticide we use is less than it was. So that's good. The reason why productivity hasn't gone up is that if you think about it, you, you've got to mutate a particular strain of plant. Mm -hmm. So you've got to choose a plant that is happy to have these extra genes stuck in it. Mm -hmm. That might not be the best plant for every conceivable agricultural situation. Mm -hmm. And the, the crops have been developed for the large-scale intensive monocultures that we see in particular in the USA, mm -hmm. and they are useless. Uh, if you're a small scale farmer in Africa somewhere, uh, you're a small holder, you, th these, these won't work. They're not appropriate. And even 
in many U.S. conditions, they are not necessarily the most productive crop because the uh, the, the, the the strains that have been manipulated are the best ones because they've got to make a choice. You can't have mm -hmm. you know they can't have every different variety of wheat for right. every different part of the country. They have to choose to make that. So it it, it my my view on on GM crops is it's a bit meh. You know, I mean, it's very clever. I'm all for the uh, the 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 decline in uh, the amount of insecticide that's used. Sure. That's fantastic. The rest sure. of it, I'm not quite so impressed by. On the other yeah. hand, when I'm in the U.S., I'm not worried about what I'm eating. You know, that's <laughs> not the issue. Right. <laughs> well, I, there's definitely, again, as it goes. I mean, there's definitely some concerns to be had for sure. Um, obviously, people go really far down the rabbit hole with this stuff. So you know, there's that, but. I do think there are some concerns for sure about about how it is. I mean, I I'm not too worried either, but I do think that it is again, I mean, you need folks that are considering some of the ethical implications, especially when you have a country that um is large as the United States and uh you know, people here consume a lot of, of food and you know, there's there's some things I guess to to definitely worry about. Um okay, so let's let's talk about uh uh we can spend good bit of time here and, and uh on gene editing and, and CRISPR I mean this is a kind of a I would say bulk of the second half of the of the book so I guess in general isn't it a, a, a how it is started it's a good thing right it's a kind of a noble goal oh, yeah. that we could say well look you know if, if we're we're taking out all of these bad genes for people that have illnesses like ALS or Alzheimer's or all these things all the potential is there um so maybe kind of give us the lighter side of it, right? I mean, there's there's some some work. I think there's some work done for HIV as well. But and then we can get into a, some some yeah, of the yeah. whole thing of so just recreating whole humans. I mean, that's that's a whole other kind of ethical question. So what's the kind of lighter side of this or the potential? Well, CRISPR became a, uh, a technology that could apply to uh, you could you could program. Uh, your enzymes to edit DNA, to change DNA in exactly the way you wanted. Mm -hmm. uh, so without uh, the randomness of GM genes inserting, you would target a particular piece of DNA and alter it in the way that you wanted. Mm -hmm. uh, that became a, a viable technology in 2012, 2013. And it immediately began to transform uh, science and basic discovery. Um, and it is used all over the world to study all. Basically, if you can if you can rear an organism in the laboratory, uh, you can use CRISPR. So, mm. it, in my area, which is kind of animal behavior and so on, mm -hmm. um, I you know the, people have been able to alter the genes in ants. Uh, in very specific ways, which has told us very interesting things, if you're interested in such stuff, about the role of the olfactory system and how the brain is organized, wow. which has completely changed what we thought, because all that we knew before was just based on one species of fly. And now mm. we can study other insects relatively easily, because mm. this new technology is available, and we go, oh, okay, that was just, we thought that was typical, it turns out to be a weird exception. Mm. This is more likely what the, the overall situation is. So it's, it's providing amazing science knowledge. In terms of medicine, what in principle this can do, and this has already begun to happen in uh, ex clinical experiments and the very beginnings of clinical trials, is that where you have a disease uh, that affects in cells that are easily accessible, so in particular blood cells, mm -hmm. uh, that is you can get out the, uh, the stem cells that are going to create blood cells from people's bone marrow, you can put them into a test tube, you can then manipulate their genes and then re-inject them. I'm, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm paraphrasing a great deal here. This is yeah, much yeah. more complicated than that, but you can see it's relatively straightforward. Mm -hmm. um, you can, there are diseases such as, for example, sickle disease, which yep. is a massive issue, hundreds of thousands of people around the world, yep. uh, in particular, mainly, but not entirely people uh, of uh, recent or Afro Caribbean or African origin or African Americans. Right, right, right. And that is very, very painful, extremely unpleasant. And it's caused by a single letter of DNA. Right. So uh, in principle, we can change that letter in your red blood cells, mm -hmm. put the red blood cells in, and hey, presto, uh, you're going to be uh, cured. And although that in single letter change hasn't yet been done in a 
in a human it works in cell lines and in humans we have got people who've had other approaches to changing what's called the hemoglobin which is the molecule mm -hmm. that absorbs oxygen which is the issue here um in people and led to effective cures of mm. sickle cell disease um there are similar diseases that affect people in the in the far east where which are also being studied in this way uh hiv has in a number of people i mean these are all experiments these aren't trials sure. yet sure, sure. um uh have been cured of hiv using this this approach mm. or similar gene editing uh, approach that was developed before CRISPR. So there are fantastic possibilities for what's called somatic uh, ge genetic engineering, so or gene therapies. These are the cells that are in your body. They're not cells that are going to be passed on to the next generation. So whatever mm, you do mm, to yourself mm. won't affect uh, the your offspring if you have any. So I, I, that is, you're absolutely right. This is a fantastic success story uh there are huge possibilities in the future however just because we have that technology doesn't mean to say it's going to be equitably distributed as right, one right. scientist put it you know we don't have equal access to spectacles yeah, so right, you know right, right. how are we gonna if you think of sickle cell disease I mean, it's fairly obvious who's going to benefit from that. It's sure, going to be sure. primarily people in the West and the people in Africa aren't necessarily going to mm. benefit from that. So I guess one question here then is many of the things I've heard about CRISPR is people have said like, you know, this is really, you know, just to kind of to borrow from the US title, right? It was playing God, right? You know, this is what you're doing. You're just, you know, swapping things out. You're, 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 you're moving against the natural order of things of sorts. But I guess the thing with CRISPR, that's, that's the one the one pushback I've heard on this is that, well, this works for things that have one or a few genes, but most things that are genetically heritable, I mean, even if you look at, we used to think that it was very kind of a one-to-one -one thing, but even something like height has a bunch of genes oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. that are involved. And in many cases, for so many things, we don't know how many traits, how, how many genes are involved. We, we, we might have observed, you know, okay, this has you know, especially, and then when you scale up to like behavior and intelligence and all these other really complicated things, thousands of genes involved. So is, is, is CRISPR really only good on like a one-to-one -one thing? Like, okay, we can see there's 22 genes implicated. We don't think there's any more. Boom. Okay. But when you're talking about hundreds and thousands of genes implicated, doesn't that get more complicated? Yeah. I mean, and the example I generally give of this is because people always worry and say, okay, well, we're, you know, um, we have Goldwyn law emerges people start rapidly start talking about the nazis and hitler so you know if we can manipulate our genes we're all going to end up with a lot of nazis marching down the mall uh to <laughs> right. the white house well you know, that nearly happened actually um or did yeah. happen. but mm -hmm. anyway uh let's just say you were you were a real nazi and you wanted to be certain you were going to have a blue-eyed baby right mm -hmm. <laughs> for whatever reason that's the thing you've got right. to have a blue-eyed right. baby Right. Now, we all learn at school that, you know, you've got genes for blue eyes and brown eyes. And if you mm -hmm. know, that's the way you think. That, yeah, it doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. There basically uh, there are up to six, at least 60 genes involved in eye color. And yeah. more or less, pretty much, if you've got any parents of any color eyes, they can have any color eye baby. So mm -hmm. you to be absolutely certain if you're a real hardcore Nazi and you really wanted to have that blue eyed Aryan baby, you would have to manipulate 60 genes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and at the moment, that would be not only uh, problematic, difficult, it would be very dangerous because the sure. thing about CRISPR and why it isn't simply a pair of scissors is that it depends on you've got to trick the cell, you cut DNA, and then you trick the cell into using a piece of DNA that you've introduced into the cell as, as a way of repairing this, this, this cut in the, in the DNA molecule. The yeah. cells don't like their DNA matched up. It's not good for them. So they, they try and fix it as soon as they can. And the cell has got to be in the right state for this to work properly. And what we now know is that in human um, human embryo cell, embryonic cells, so mm -hmm, you know, if you were mm -hmm. going to manipulate them, every cell in the body, that in fact large chunks of DNA can get mashed up by the CRISPR process. You can lose whole chromosomes. Mm. Uh, and this is in the last three years, it is is pretty scary what, what yeah. can happen. So I, you know, you, you might end up with a blue eyed baby, you might end up with a, a dead embryo as well, yeah. because yeah. rather than being a pair of scissors, this is more like a kind of chainsaw gone amok. It can just chop up all over the place. 
depending on the state of the cell. So mm -hmm. you've really got to understand your system and the human embryo seems to be particularly complicated mm -hmm. and particularly vulnerable to you know, taking some bad biochemical decisions if you chop up its DNA and starting mm -hmm. to do all sorts of crazy stuff. So, yeah, I mean, it is it is not only it's ethically wrong, it's dangerous, and it is incredibly complicated. I mean, yeah. I can't see any reason for, for doing it. Yeah, yeah. You, you also talk about, you know, this kind of germline editing as well. And you talk yeah. about why we should use caution, suspicion, and maybe some fear. Maybe just briefly mention that of, of why we should, we should really come at this yeah, very so, hesitantly. Uh, well, for start, what I've just said, that it can all go horribly wrong and almost right, certainly right. will do. Uh, right. The moment we don't have the ways of controlling sufficiently the, uh, the the embryo and the state of the cell that when when we're intervening to make it. But we know and we know this can go wrong because in November 2018, Hu Jiankui, a Chinese researcher, announced that he had changed to uh, mutated two embryos that had come to term and we're now born two little girls we now know there was a third one uh mm -hmm. and what to cut a very long story short uh there was no reason to do this it was an experiment the girls were normal until he got his hands on them and he mutated them in ways that went beyond what he expected uh, he didn't introduce the mutations he thought he was going to introduce not every cell has been affected so they're mosaic and we have not seen a full genome of these girls, but even in the poor data that he did present, we saw that there are what are called off-target effects. In other words, the scissors started snipping up some other bits of egg. Oh, um, we don't know anything about the girls. They're not a circus. That's as it should be. Sure, uh, sure, fingers sure. crossed they're going to be okay. Sure. So we know it goes wrong. But the the real reason is that that terrible event led people to finally start saying, well, why are we doing this? Mm -hmm. Why are we wanting to edit the human germline? Uh, because up until then, from 2015 onwards, there had been this, people had said, we're on a, a prudent path. That's mm -hmm. what we've got to do. We've got to have a prudent path with no discussion of what's safe. What I mean, at least a cinema was very clear. This is dangerous. Don't do it. You know, mm -hmm. or only do it under the circumstances. There was no discussion like that. It was just accepted. This was like a set of scissors and, okay, maybe we can go and live on other planets. You know, that was one of the things people were seriously discussing. It's mm -hmm. just crazy. Mm -hmm. Um and now people have started saying, well, why would you want to do this? Why would you want to edit a human embryo? And the main answer people give is, well, you want to get rid of a genetic disease. Right. Okay. But at the moment, we have a way of doing that. And it involves IVF. If you've got two parents mm -hmm. who, or potential parents who want to have a healthy offspring, unaffected offspring, then they have I do IVF, which is pretty grim just getting that far. Talk mm -hmm. to a woman who's had it and you'll, mm -hmm. you know, you know mm -hmm. that it's not fun. Yeah, but you not. do IVF. And then you select the embryo that is not affected by the genetic disease and you implant that and the rest you discard. Mm -hmm. Now, the, that procedure, which is does not involve any genetic manipulation, that procedure is the, will sort the problem, the desire, meet the desire of people to have their own biologically uh, related healthy child in the vast majority of cases. The only number, the only people who can't be treated that way are parents with particular versions of genetic diseases. And it's estimated there's maybe 200 such couples around the world. Mm. So all that for that. Now, you know, there's no right. You can't, there's no, there's no right to have a child. Lots mm. of people want to have children and can't for all sorts of reasons. And that's miserable and very frustrating, but that highlights what in fact the technique is it's a way of responding to the desires of humans of adults mm -hmm. to have a healthy child you're not curing anybody of anything nobody exists until you put the egg and sperm together yeah. you're allowing a certain kind of human to come into existence mm -hmm. um and uh, my view is that for all the ethical reasons the safety reasons i've outlined to we shouldn't be doing this for you know to meet the desires of two people around the world uh no we shouldn't do it it's wrong yeah yeah well there's many other things i could talk to you about in the book uh but i want to be respectful of your time the the last question i have is uh is about kind of like where where we go in the future right so we, we've seen all these things we've heard all these things we've heard all the warnings so how do we how do we how do we construct an ethical framework in our institutions that have balanced oversight 
to extract the positive aspects of genetic engineering without playing with the very dangerous aspects of genetic engineering. How, how do, what are your, what are your thoughts? How, do, how can we do that? Yeah. And you, well, you put your finger on the, on the, on the real issue because, and furthermore, uh, something I don't deal with in the book, but you know, there's going to be more stuff coming down. Mm-hmm. We're going to have mm-hmm. even better more effective, more powerful, more dramatic ways of manipulating genes in the future. So we're going to have to think very hard about this. I think the first way is, as you've indicated, is that you need to have, and I think geneticists are beginning to understand this. I mean, they've, as I said, they've got a fantastic 50-year tradition that no other science can match of saying, this is scary, we should stop doing that. No other science has done this, and we've done it four times. And I've spoken to lots of people. None of them are crazy. None of them are Victor sure. Frankenstein. Sure, no, sure. You know, they're all well-meaning. Sure. And because of that, they've taken these steps to say, okay, we should pause this research. Um, we should... They recognize increasingly they need to talk to and have around them debating these new techniques, the uh, the ethicists, the philosophers, the historians who can say, well, think about this. What about this? Look at this historical example. Does this give you pause for thought so that they can they can reflect even before because you've got to meet these issues before they happen. That's right. Because That's we right. go back to the, the self-replicating acts. It's too late there. So, you know, if you think about people who work in transport, say they, you know, the railway industry, they've got very strict laws and regulations about how you run a railway. But those laws and regulations are literally written because we made Mm -hmm. terrible mistakes. Mm -hmm. People died. And then we realize, okay, we can do things better. Let's have that. This is what you do. You you know, you bear a red signal or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, So we need to we can't afford to make those mistakes in genetics. We've got to work it out beforehand. So you need people who can challenge the scientists and i also think that i mean and, and therefore getting scientists to think about this and that's one of the points of my book is to you know right, yeah. i know a lot of people are going to be reading it are going to be people who work in this field who want to understand the history of it better mm-hmm. um so it's also getting them to think okay right well we need to have these people on board in our project that means that mm-hmm. nih or other grant awarding bodies need to think about having part of their grants devoted to you know having these kind of discussions Uh, for new techniques in terms of applications so all of the areas we've talked about i i think and i recognize this is a bit pie in the sky but we have at the moment dangerous technology which we employ relatively safety safely we have atomic power Mm -hmm. and we have civil aviation both of which can go horribly wrong and yet so far, things have gone okay, partly because we have international structures, international regulation mm-hmm. that uh, enables these things to be done safely. And I think organizations, some kind of international regulatory organization, for example, genetic manipulation that affects the environment, but also for uh, genetic manipulation of dangerous viruses. I think that's the kind of international structure we need where these things can be discussed, where there's the input of the public as well, uh, t- to understand these things, to say we should be doing this or we shouldn't be doing that. But, uh, you know, those the, the structures that organize uh, or run civil aviation and atomic energy, they were created in a rather different world where the world had an appetite for international regulation. Regulation. We're not there anymore. In particular, the US is completely elsewhere, is mm-hmm. not interested in that. Mm-hmm. So uh, I think the solution we have in our hands, but it's very unlikely it's going to be um it's going to be implemented uh, until maybe it's too late. Maybe something does have to go wrong for everybody to kind of wake up and say, okay, we really need to take this more seriously. Mm-hmm. And with luck, it will not, even if something does go wrong, it'll not be. Uh, catastrophic. Uh, mm-hmm. um, but th- it is very, it is worrying. I mean, at the end of the process of going through this history and studying the science more, I'm still worried. I mean, I am optimistic, you know, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. I know you, you said the book was <laughs> had a bit of a downer, was mm-hmm. highlighting the, the, the problems. I do try to emphasize that as a tool for discovery, for understanding the world, this, I mean, you know, in my own work, you know, mm-hmm. this has absolutely changed how we do things over yeah. the last 20 years. It's, mm-hmm. it, I mean, I was talking to my students yesterday, kind of gave them a talk about what I've been working on really for the last nearly half century mm-hmm. and describing how I began in the early 1970s. 
and then what we can do now and the transformation mm. because of genetic engineering mm. in understanding basic biology is absolutely extraordinary. Mm. The issue comes when it, like with any technology, you know, yeah. like with yeah. the internet, it's right. when it meets the outside world and mm -hmm. that's when it can get kind of tricky and that's when we need to have deeper harder thought than scientists are used to doing you know mm -hmm. <laughs> you talk to philosophers and they have some very sharp questions yeah. uh, that make you think really hard and mm -hmm. they're the kind of people we need to have involved in this yeah yeah and no, I, I i totally agree with you well the book is called as gods a moral history of the genetic age uh it's out everywhere now which is which is great it's out in the uk it's out in the us it's out everywhere right? yeah yeah it's out in the uk it's out in the us all over the world well, that's great that's it's spreading that's... everywhere it's like a virus <laughs> it is <laughs> it is a i mean quite honestly it's a phenomenal book it really is a phenomenal book i i really uh recommend it very very highly um where can people find yourself and best ways to to reach you um i well at the moment uh i'm still on twitter <laughs> at matthew cobb and mm -hmm. I I do have a Mastodon account if people can stand going there. Uh, mm -hmm. Same thing at Matthew Cobb. Uh, and then you can email me if you've got a question or, or something. That's fine. You can find me on the internet. That's that's wonderful, uh, Matthew. Thank you so much for for the conversation. I it was it was a big delight, and I, I really appreciate it. Thanks a lot for the invitation. It's been great being here. Yes, yes. Thank you. <laughs>